In an era when speaking one's mind was reserved for the bold, Mae West dared to whisper then shout her truths into the roaring silence of societal expectation. She was a woman who owned her desires, her wit sharper than the censorship that sought to silence her. With a career that danced daringly on the edge of scandal, West became not just a subject of controversy but a beacon of unapologetic self-expression. As whispers turned into headlines, Mae West's provocations were not merely for shock value, they were declarations of her fierce independence. Her battles with censorship were legendary, a testament to her refusal to be anything but authentically Mae. But were her scandalous quips and daring roles merely the antics of a Hollywood starlet? Or were they the calculated moves of a woman far ahead of her time? Mae West, the scandalous queen of early Hollywood, was more than just her controversies. She was a pioneer, a strategist in the art of fame, using scandal as a spotlight to illuminate her talent and challenge the status quo. This video delves into the life of Mae West, a woman who wielded her wit and sexuality like weapons, cutting through the constraints of her time to leave an indelible mark on Hollywood and beyond. Prepare to uncover the story of Mae West, a woman who was not just a part of Hollywood's history, but a force that helped shape it. A Star is Born In the bustling streets of Brooklyn, New York on August 17, 1893, a star was born into an era ripe for change. Mae West, christened Mary Jane West, entered the world with a spark that would ignite a firestorm of controversy and admiration in equal measure. The daughter of a prize fighter and a corset model, May inherited a blend of toughness and allure that would define her persona both on and off the stage. From a young age, May was no stranger to the spotlight. By the tender age of seven, she was performing at church socials, her confidence overshadowing her years. It wasn't long before the vaudeville stages of New York called, and May answered with gusto. By her teens, she was a seasoned performer, crafting characters that flirted with the boundaries of propriety and daring to say what others only dared to think. The early 1900s were a time of rigid social norms and strict moral codes, but May West saw these as mere suggestions. Her first foray into Broadway with the play Sex in 1926 was a bold declaration of her views on sexuality and freedom. The play was a sensation, not just for its content, but for the audacity of its creator. May not only wrote the play, but also starred as its lead, embodying the role of a liberated woman in control of her destiny. Sex was a triumph in attendance, but a scandal in the eyes of the law. In 1927, May was arrested and charged with obscenity. The trial was a spectacle, with May using the courtroom as yet another stage from which to project her unyielding belief in personal freedom. She served eight days in jail, a sentence she claimed to have worn like a badge of honor, turning her incarceration into yet another tool for publicity. This brush with the law did little to deter May, if anything, it solidified her status as a provocateur and a champion of free expression. She returned to Broadway with Diamond Lil in 1928, a play that introduced the world to one of her most enduring characters. Diamond Lil was a flamboyant, savvy woman of the night, traits that would become synonymous with West herself. Mae West's early career was a dance between scandal and success, each step carefully choreographed to challenge the status quo while captivating the public's imagination. She was more than an actress or a playwright. She was a cultural icon in the making, a woman whose name would become etched in the annals of entertainment history. Broadway's Provocateur Following the uproar of sex and her brief stint behind bars, Mae West's resolve only strengthened. She returned to the Broadway stage with Diamond Lil in 1928, a production that would cement her status as a theatrical force. The character of Diamond Lil, a savvy, sexually autonomous woman navigating the underbelly of New York society, was a reflection of West herself, bold, unapologetic, and deeply in tune with the complexities of female power and desire, 
Diamond Lil was a roaring success, captivating audiences with its blend of humor, drama, and May's undeniable charisma. The play's success was a testament to West's skill as a writer and performer, but also to her keen understanding of public appetite. She knew what people wanted, entertainment that was both provocative and intelligent, and she delivered it with unmatched flair. The success of Diamond Lil catapulted May to new heights of fame. She became a fixture of the New York social scene, her every move followed by the press. Yet, despite her growing celebrity, May remained focused on her craft. She continued to write and perform, pushing the boundaries of what was considered acceptable on the Broadway stage. In the early 1930s, Hollywood began to take notice of this Broadway sensation. The film industry was in the midst of a transition, with the advent of talkies revolutionizing cinema. Studios were on the lookout for new talent, and Mae West, with her distinctive voice and larger-than-life persona, was a perfect fit. Paramount Pictures extended an offer, and May, ever the opportunist, saw the potential for a new platform from which to share her unique brand of entertainment. She made her film debut in Night After Night, 1932, a move that would mark the beginning of her storied Hollywood career. But May's transition to film was not just a change of medium, it was a strategic expansion of her influence. In Hollywood, she would not only be a star, but a writer and a shaper of her own image. She negotiated unprecedented control over her scripts, ensuring that her film characters echoed the boldness and wit of her stage personas. Hollywood Calls As Mae West stepped into the glittering world of Hollywood, she brought with her the audacity and wit that had made her a Broadway star. Her arrival in the film industry was timely. Hollywood was in the throes of the pre-code era, a golden window before strict censorship would clamp down on the creative liberties filmmakers enjoyed. May's debut in Night After Night was more than just an entrance. It was a declaration that she was here to stay, and Hollywood would never be the same. May's impact was immediate. In Night After Night, a film that initially had her cast in a supporting role, May's presence was so magnetic that she stole the show. Her famous line, delivered with the perfect blend of innuendo and confidence, why don't you come up sometime and see me, became an instant catchphrase, embodying the May West persona that would captivate audiences. Paramount Pictures, recognizing the gold mine they had, quickly signed May to a contract, making her one of the highest paid actresses of her time. With this new platform, May took Hollywood by storm, starring in and scripting films like She Done Him Wrong, 1933, and I'm No Angel, 1933. These films not only showcased May's talent, but also her unparalleled ability to craft characters and narratives that resonated with audiences while pushing societal boundaries. She Done Him Wrong and I'm No Angel were monumental successes, breaking box office records and saving Paramount Pictures from the brink of bankruptcy. May's portrayal of strong, sexually confident women was revolutionary, offering a stark contrast to the demure female roles that had dominated the screen. Her characters were in control, unafraid of their desires and unapologetically themselves, reflecting May's own philosophy of life. However, May's success and her challenges to societal norms did not go unnoticed by the censors. The Hayes Code, Hollywood's attempt to self-regulate content deemed immoral or obscene, was about to take full effect and Mae West's films were squarely in its sights. Her work, which thrived on double entendres and sexual innuendo, was exactly the kind of content the Code aimed to cleanse from the silver screen. The tightening of censorship marked a turning point in May's career. Her subsequent films faced heavy editing and censorship, diluting the very essence that made her work stand out. Despite these challenges, May's spirit remained unbroken. She continued to work within the confines of the code, using her wit and intelligence to navigate the restrictions placed upon her. May West's foray into Hollywood was a testament to her brilliance as an entertainer and her resilience in the face of adversity. She had not only made her mark, but had also paved the way for future generations of women in entertainment, challenging the industry's norms and fighting for the freedom of expression. 
Hollywood had called and Mae West had answered, forever altering the landscape of American cinema. The censorship battles. As Mae West's star ascended in Hollywood, so too did the scrutiny of her work. The early 1930s, a period of relative freedom in film content, was drawing to a close, and the Hayes Code, introduced in 1930 but loosely enforced, was about to tighten its grip on Hollywood. May, with her risque dialogue and bold portrayals of female sexuality, found herself at the forefront of this impending cultural clash. The release of I'm No Angel in 1933 coincided with a pivotal moment in Hollywood history. The film, which May both wrote and starred in, was a box office triumph, but it also became a lightning rod for censorship debates. May's character, a circus performer who uses her wit and charm to climb the social ladder, was a direct challenge to the traditional roles women were expected to play, both on screen and in society. The success of May's films had made her an icon of empowerment, but to the newly empowered Production Code Administration led by Joseph Breen, she represented a threat to moral standards. The administration began to enforce the code more strictly, demanding cuts and changes to scripts before they could be produced. May's work was particularly targeted, with censors meticulously combing through her dialogue for any hint of impropriety. May ever resourceful, responded to these challenges with her characteristic wit, she found ways to skirt the censor's demands, embedding her dialogue with double entendres that flew under the radar of the code's enforcers. Her ability to do so was a testament to her skill as a writer and her understanding of the cultural boundaries she was navigating. Despite her efforts, the enforcement of the Hayes Code marked a shift in Mae West's career. Her films after the code's strict enforcement lacked the same provocative edge, leading to a decline in her box office draw. The landscape of American cinema was changing, and May, once the queen of innuendo and sexual freedom, found her kingdom increasingly constrained by censorship. The battles Mae West faced against censorship were not merely about artistic freedom, they were reflective of a larger societal struggle over the control of female sexuality and expression. May's defiance of the code and her attempts to navigate its restrictions were emblematic of her broader fight for personal and creative autonomy. In the face of these challenges, Mae West's legacy as a pioneer of sexual liberation and a challenger of censorship was cemented. Her battles with the Hayes Code would go down in history as a critical moment in the fight for freedom of expression in Hollywood, underscoring the enduring impact of her work on American culture and cinema. Ian of Sexual Liberation In the midst of her censorship battles, Mae West emerged as a beacon of sexual liberation far ahead of her time. Her unabashed embrace of her sexuality and her advocacy for personal freedom resonated deeply in a society bound by conservative norms. May's influence extended beyond the silver screen. She became a symbol of the burgeoning movement for sexual liberation and gender equality. May's public persona and her characters shared a common thread, a refusal to conform to the expectations placed upon women. She portrayed strong, independent women who were in control of their destinies and unashamed of their desires. This portrayal was revolutionary, challenging the notion that women's sexuality should be repressed or hidden. Beyond her roles, May was vocal about her beliefs in interviews and public appearances. She advocated for the right to love freely, regardless of societal constraints. Her support for the LGBTQ community, at a time when such stances were rare, further solidified her status as a progressive icon. May's mansion in Hollywood became a gathering place for artists, writers, and actors, including those marginalized by mainstream society. May's approach to sexuality was not just about defiance, it was also about empowerment. She believed in the power of self-expression as a means of gaining autonomy and respect. This philosophy was evident in her personal life as well. May's relationships, often with younger men, defied the double standards that celebrated male sexuality while vilifying female desire. The impact of May West's advocacy for sexual liberation was profound. 
She opened doors for discussions about sexuality and gender that would gain momentum in the decades following her heyday. Her legacy in this arena is a testament to her foresight and courage. May understood that the personal was political, and her life was a living example of this principle. The Art of Scandal May West's career was a masterclass in the art of scandal, a delicate dance between controversy and acclaim that she navigated with unparalleled grace. Each scandal, rather than diminishing her star, only seemed to burnish it further, endearing her to a public hungry for the bold and the sensational. May understood the power of scandal not just as a tool for publicity, but as a weapon against the constraints of her time. Her approach to scandal was strategic. May never shied away from controversy, instead she embraced it, using it to highlight the absurdity of societal taboos. Her arrests and the censorship battles she faced were not setbacks, but opportunities to engage in a larger conversation about freedom of expression and the role of women in society. May's ability to turn scandal into dialogue was a testament to her intelligence and her understanding of the media landscape. May's scandals were not just personal battles, they were public performances that challenged the status quo. Her arrest for sex and the subsequent trial was a national sensation covered extensively in the press. May's response to the controversy was to wear it as a badge of honor, famously quipping that it had taken her all the way to bank. This ability to spin scandal to her advantage was one of May's most remarkable talents. The art of scandal, as practiced by Mae West, was about more than just generating headlines. It was about challenging and changing cultural norms. Each controversy she stirred was a strike against the puritanical constraints of her era, a deliberate act of rebellion against a society that sought to confine her. Mae's scandals were calculated, crafted with the precision of a playwright, each one a scene in the larger drama of her public life. May West's legacy in the art of scandal is enduring. She demonstrated that controversy, when wielded by a master, could be a force for change, a way to push society forward. May's scandals were not just moments of rebellion. They were catalysts for a broader dialogue about sexuality, censorship, and the role of women in the public sphere. Through her mastery of scandal, May West left an indelible mark on American culture, one that continues to resonate long after the headlines faded. Enigmatic Twilight As the golden glow of May West's career in the limelight began to dim, she ventured into an enigmatic twilight, a period marked by a curious blend of public adoration and private mystique. Even as the fervor of Hollywood's golden age waned, May remained a figure of fascination, her later years shrouded in the same blend of scandal and allure that had marked her ascent. In the 1950s and 1960s, May West's presence in film and theater became less frequent, yet her influence lingered in the air like a perfume. She turned to the nightclub circuit, where her performances were celebrated not just for their entertainment value, but for the nostalgia they evoked for a bygone era. May's shows were lavish affairs, a testament to her undiminished star power and her unwavering commitment to her persona. May's twilight years were also marked by a foray into the spiritual and the esoteric. She developed an interest in spiritualism, a reflection perhaps of her lifelong defiance of conventional norms. May's exploration of these realms added a layer of depth to her public image, casting her as a seeker of truths beyond the material world. This period of her life was characterized by a quieter, more introspective form of rebellion, a search for meaning in the twilight of her career. Despite her retreat from the public eye, May West remained a subject of public intrigue. Rumors swirled about her personal life, her health, and her wealth, each tidbit of gossip adding to the mythology that had always surrounded her. May lived her later years in a Los Angeles apartment, a space as grand and eclectic as the woman herself. It was here that she entertained guests, held court with the press, and continued to write, her pen as sharp as ever. May West's final public appearance in the film Sextet, 1978, was a fitting coda to her career. 
At the age of 85, she played a glamorous film star delivering lines with the same wit and verve that had catapulted her to fame decades earlier. The film was not a critical success, but it served as a reminder of May's enduring charisma and her unparalleled ability to captivate an audience. May West passed away in 1980, but the enigma of her twilight years only added to her legend. She left behind a legacy that was as complex as it was captivating, a blend of scandal, success, and spiritual search that continues to fascinate. Mae West's twilight was not a fading away, but a deepening, a final act that ensured her immortality in the pantheon of Hollywood legends. The Immortal Mae West In the years following Mae West's passing, her status as an icon of early Hollywood only grew, transcending the scandals and controversies that had once defined her public persona. The immortal Mae West became a symbol of empowerment, her legacy enduring through a blend of nostalgia, admiration, and the timeless relevance of her message. May's influence permeated popular culture from fashion to music, film to feminist discourse. Her signature style, bold, glamorous, and unmistakably May, inspired generations of women to embrace their individuality and sexuality with confidence. Designers and stylists drew upon her image, recreating her looks on runways and red carpets, a testament to her lasting impact on fashion. In the realm of entertainment, Mae West's pioneering spirit lived on. Filmmakers and playwrights revisited her work, finding in her films and scripts a rich source of inspiration. Documentaries and biopics explored her life, each attempting to capture the essence of a woman who was as complex as she was, charismatic. Her quotes, brimming with wit and wisdom, became part of the lexicon, often cited in discussions about gender, sexuality, and empowerment. The feminist movement, too, found a forebear in Mae West. Scholars and activists looked to her as an early champion of women's rights, celebrating her defiance of societal norms and her advocacy for sexual liberation. May's life and work were studied, debated, and celebrated in academic circles, her contributions to the fight for gender equality recognized and revered. Yet for all the public fascination with Mae West, she remained an enigma, a figure shrouded in mystery. Stories of her private life, her relationships, her beliefs, her final days, were the subject of speculation and intrigue. May had carefully curated her public image, and even in death, she kept the world guessing. Mae West's legacy was not just in the roles she played or the lines she delivered, it was in the lives she touched and the barriers she broke. She had become more than a star. She was a cultural icon, a beacon of boldness, and a symbol of the enduring power of individuality. The immortal Mae West lived on, her legacy a testament to the extraordinary life she had led and the indelible mark she had left on the world. It doesn't take a genius to know that one has to be daring and unconventional to be able to survive in Hollywood. But as early as the 1940s, several Hollywood icons have shown us just how daring they are. From falling in love with women half their age to marrying men over two decades older, this video tells the story of some of the most unconventional love and romances Hollywood has ever witnessed, proving once and for all that love indeed conquers all. But then again, not all of these stories have a happy ending. Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. It all started in the 1940s when the 45-year-old actor Humphrey Bogart first set his eyes on Lauren Bacall on a movie set. It was at that moment that he made up his mind to pursue the 19-year-old actress at all costs. Unlike these days when the world embraces all kinds of relationships, the 1940s were a bit different and conventional. It was rare to see couples with decade-long age gaps, which was why Hollywood practically froze when Humphrey and Bogart and Lauren Hall fell madly in love with each other. The two met initially during the filming of To Have and Have Not in 1944. Lauren Bacall had just gotten her first lead role, and she was beyond elated. Her career was about to change, but she didn't know that her entire life was about to change as well. Lauren had seen Bogart in movies in the past, but she didn't see anything beyond his acting skills. As a matter of fact, when Lauren's friends tried to tease her about playing alongside Bogart, she would respond with, Yuck! 
Under no circumstance did she feel anything more than professional respect for Bogart, but perhaps she was wrong. One of the most significant romances of her life was about to begin, and she had no idea. When they finally met on set in 1944, she found something incredibly curious. Bogart was not this disgusting old man she had laughed with her friends about. No, he was so much more. He was charming, kind, considerate, and had a very good sense of humor. Ironically, Bogart, on the other hand, became smitten by the 19-year-old actress the moment she stepped on set. He had seen a lot of beautiful women in his life, but there was something fascinating about Lauren that he couldn't quite put his finger on. She had a different type of beauty, one that appealed greatly to him. Her face looked like that of a goddess, and she had this cute innocence about her. Bogart was intrigued. On top of that, he could also see how talented she was. However, one small flaw was very evident. Lauren was extremely nervous on set, and Bogart, being the smitten man that he was, decided to help her. As the two got closer on set every passing day, Bogart would do all he could to ease Lauren's nerves. He would tell her jokes to calm her down, and little by little, Lauren began to get more confident, and a sudden realization hit her. Bogart was not so bad after all. Soon enough, Lauren decided to stop holding back and she let Bogart in completely, and as a result, the trajectory of their relationship began to take a rather interesting turn. First, the two became really close friends, enjoying each other's company, talking for as long as they wanted, laughing, joking, and making jest. Then it began to morph into something a little more personal and intimate as the two began to have more and more alone times in Lauren's dressing room. Now, to the rest of the crew, something was going on, but perhaps it was just actor chemistry or something. They decided not to give it too much thought, because if they were being honest, the age gap between the two was mighty awkward and they couldn't bring themselves to imagine a romance brewing between them. Even between Bogart and Lauren, their relationship was undefined, until one day Bogart did something that took Lauren's breath away. One day, after a long day on set, Lauren hurried to her dressing room to rest. Bogart followed her in as he has always done before where they would talk and laugh, but this time Bogart had something else in mind. In the middle of their conversation, he gently leaned in and held Lauren's chin, bringing her lips to his, and in that moment, nothing else mattered. They had sealed their relationship. However, this was not a fairy tale story. There were a dozen stumbling blocks in the way. The crew was happy for them when they realized the couple was in love, but the film director, Howard Hawks, whose wife brought Lauren on set, was not happy with the romance, especially with a man almost thrice her age. On top of that, Bogart was still married to his then third wife, Method. But despite all, the relationship grew stronger, forcing Bogart to divorce her, and on May 21, 1945, Bogart and Lauren tied the knot. A marriage and relationship that, although unconventional, became one of the strongest and most powerful in Hollywood. Charlie Chaplin and Una O'Neill. Plagued by loneliness and a victim of his own success, Charlie Chaplin was one of the most successful men in Hollywood. But deep down, there was a huge hole in his heart that he never thought would be filled until one day he met Una O'Neill. And right there and then, he knew he had found the one. It was the height of his career, and his success so far knew no bounds. Some may even say Charlie distracted himself by plunging into his work, and unknowingly, he was setting himself up for more and more successes, but he kept his aching heart to himself. But all that was about to change very soon. In the year 1942, Charlie attended a party hosted by Charles Lawton, a British actor and director. Somewhere on the other end of the spectrum, a young lady who was aspiring to become an actress attended the same party. Her name, Una O'Neill. Unlike a lot of other aspiring actresses who were looking to get into Hollywood for fame and recognition, Una was more into acting because of a burning passion for theater. She had been raised in an artistic family, and all her life, literature and theater were all she knew. She was beautiful, intelligent, and had a grace that caught attention whenever she walked in, but her mission at this party was simply to meet people who could help her career. Little did she know that fate had planned a lot more for her that evening. The room was fairly large, but from the other end, Chaplin's eyes caught something striking, and that was when it happened. He laid eyes on Una and became instantly captivated by her radiant presence. He had to meet her, he had to get to know her, and he did. She was more than he thought she was. 
not just a pretty face, but she had a sort of depth that intrigued him. Despite a significant age difference, with Chaplin being 53 and Una just 17, their connection was undeniable. So soon after, they began spending time together, engaging in lively conversations and sharing laughter, ultimately forging a strong bond. Make no mistake, despite the connection between Chaplin and Una, they came from completely different backgrounds. While she came from a humble but artistic past, Chaplin was involved in political and wartime pasts and backlash, but despite all, the couple found solace in each other, and their union gave them joy. More and more people around the couple began to get aware of the relationship and connection between them, and a lot of thoughts were raised. Despite the significant age difference, people thought their relationship won't last. They were from different worlds and were known for different things. What could they possibly have in common, people thought. Chaplin was a seasoned entertainer, celebrated for his iconic character, The Tramp, and his work as a filmmaker. Una, on the other hand, was young and relatively unknown in the industry, possessing an innate charm and natural talent. Perhaps this was solely a transactional relationship that would soon end. But soon enough, Chaplin shut the mouths of naysayers once and for all. In 1943, Chaplin took the bold step and proposed to Una, and without even a moment's pause she accepted, agreeing to become his fourth wife. As one may imagine, their union raised eyebrows and garnered considerable attention due to their age difference and the public perception of Chaplin's controversial personal life. Despite being very aware of all that was being said about their union, Chaplin and Una's relationship continued to thrive. As though to prove a point, the couple went ahead to have eight children together, raising a large and vibrant family. Over the years, Chaplin and Una built a sanctuary for their family in Switzerland, where they could retreat from the pressures of Hollywood and enjoy a quieter, more private life. They found solace in the beauty of nature and the bonds they forged with their children. Una became a pillar of strength and stability for Chaplin, standing by his side during his later years when he faced accusations and controversies. Sadly, Charlie Chaplin finally passed away on December 25, 1977, at the age of 88. He died of natural causes in his sleep at his home in corsier sur vevey Switzerland. The cause of death was recorded as a stroke, but even though Chaplin's death marked the end of an era in the entertainment industry, Una was devastated and threw herself into a state of mourning that shook the foundations of Hollywood. She noted on several occasions that Chaplin was the love of her life and she was lost without him. Una eventually passed on too at the age of 66 due to cancer, Frank Sinatra and Mia Farrow. One warm evening in July when Mia attended one of Frank's electrifying performances, she had been filming a movie nearby and just needed some time to cool off and enjoy herself. But as she stood there amidst the small crowd watching Frank, how he commanded the stage, how his voice wafted across the room in a titillating and almost sexy way, something shifted in her. To her, this was more than just a performance, it was a cry to her soul. For the entire duration of his performance, Mia couldn't take her eyes off Frank, and she couldn't shake off the feeling of being swept off her feet by his powerful performance. Frank, on the other end, despite seeing a sizable crowd, seemed to notice Mia, and he too was swept away by her beauty and grace. But he needed to focus on his performance. It was a huge battle trying not to be distracted by Mia's lingering but welcome gaze. As soon as the show was over, Mia and Frank got introduced to each other backstage and the spark between them was instantaneous. At the time, Frank was 49 years old and Mia was only 19, but they could not deny that the feelings brewing in each other were not ordinary. Their personalities merged with each other more, and the bond they created was stronger than anything they had ever felt. Over the next few months, Frank and Mia began to spend more and more time with each other. Their shared love for art and music formed the foundations of their relationship. They would talk for hours despite their age difference. They were like best of friends, maybe a bit more than that even. Soon enough, amidst all the intimate conversations they shared, late night walks and enchanting dinners at glamorous venues like the Sands Hotel's Copa Room, deeper feelings began to brew, feelings bigger than even they could handle. Not long after, a few people around them began to sniff out what was going on between them, but none of these mattered much until the media got a hold of their relationship. 
The news spread like wildfire. The media and the public at large were intrigued by the relationship and as such had a lot of things to say about them. For one, the contrast between Frank's established status in the entertainment industry and Mia's fresh-faced innocence fueled endless speculation and gossip. Some said Mia was positioning herself to be a benefactor of his money or use his connections to get more roles. Other critics dismissed their relationship as a passing fling, while some others simply scoffed at the obvious age difference and condemned their relationship on those grounds. In the heat of all these speculations that would probably break an average couple, Frank and Mia decided to shock everyone completely. On July 19, 1966, the couple tied the knot at the Sands Hotel. It was almost as though the entire Hollywood was out of breath. Everyone was shocked and speechless. Not many people believed that the relationship would stand the test of time. Then, a lot of people became believers in their love. But another larger group of critics still believed the marriage wouldn't last. And to be fair, the odds were on the critics' side. In the past, Frank had already been married and divorced three whole times. This was his fourth marriage. To everyone else, it would end up like the last three did. Mia's youth and innocence only intensified the public's fascination with their union. However, amidst the media frenzy, Frank and Mia found solace in each other's arms and nurtured a genuine connection. Throughout their relationship, Frank and Mia seemed to be shoving their love in the faces of their critics. They traveled to various enchanting destinations, escaping the relentless media attention. They frequented Palm Springs, a desert oasis where they enjoyed quiet retreats in luxurious estates surrounded by palm trees and stunning mountain views. The couple also embarked on romantic getaways to Europe, strolling hand in hand along the charming streets of Rome, Paris and Venice. However, despite the happiness they found in each other's company, Frank and Mia's relationship was not without its challenges. First, being very successful in their respective careers, they began to face its pressures because due to their jobs, they often had to spend time apart. Frank with touring and Mia pursuing her acting ambitions. On top of all that, Frank's tumultuous lifestyle and connections with powerful individuals raised eyebrows and fueled rumors of infidelity. Ultimately, the strain proved too much, and sadly, Frank and Mia decided to part ways. They announced their separation in 1968, after less than two years of marriage. Although their love story came to an end, the impact of their relationship lingered in the memories of those who witnessed their union. Aristotle Onassis and Jackie Kennedy. He was 62 years old, and she was 39, but it was the perfect match. Aristotle Onassis, immensely rich through his shipping business, had a charismatic presence and the owner of a private island. Jackie Kennedy, the widow of John F. Kennedy, simply needed solace after the tragic events at Dallas. Several times in the past, the two had crossed paths, but nothing really stuck, and there wasn't enough time to explore the depths of their personalities. But all that changed when Jackie decided one day to visit an island. It was a sunny afternoon, Jackie first set foot on an island, accompanied by her sister, Lee Radziwill. The purpose of their visit was supposed to be brief, just to get away from all the prying eyes of the public and relax in solitude and tranquility amidst the waters and fragrant olive trees. But she had no idea that her stay on this island would make her cross paths with one of the most intriguing men she had ever met. Just as she was exploring the island, she ran into him, Aristotle. Now the two had met each other before at social gatherings. They had talked before, but the conversations had been brief, polite, and filled with a bit of formality. But here on the island, perhaps it was the beauty of nature all around them, or the seclusion the island provided, but their conversations took a deeper route now, deepening their connection. Even Jackie had to confess to herself that although she had been fascinated by Aristotle before now, it was deeper and unlike anything she had ever felt before. As the days turned into weeks, Aristotle and Jackie enjoyed each other's company more than they had ever done before. They would walk along the secluded beaches, sharing their thoughts and dreams, and this formed the basis of the interest between them. Aristotle, being older and more experienced, had a life filled with lots of victories and challenges, so he was in a great position to offer Jackie some deep wisdom and a listening ear to her own problems. She was also a great companion for him despite her grief. Both of them had longed for each other, and here they were with each other. 
It was a perfect stroke of luck. Their love story flourished in the Mediterranean paradise, shielded from the prying eyes of the world. The island became a sanctuary for their burgeoning romance, a place where they could escape the pressures of their public lives. Jackie found solace in the warm embrace of Aristotle, while he reveled in her intellect, grace, and timeless beauty. Soon enough, the press, as they always do, got hold of this new relationship, and speculations and fascination were the order of the day. Many were taken aback by Jackie's choice to enter into a romance with a man of such prominence and wealth. Some saw it as a betrayal of the memory of her late husband, while others viewed it as a means to secure her future. But in 1968, to show how unbothered they were about all these speculations flying around, Aristotle proposed to Jackie, offering her the promise of a new beginning. However, just when the world could almost hear wedding bells, something terrible happened. Jackie, seemingly from nowhere, suddenly decided that marrying Aristotle was not the right move for her. All wedding plans were halted, and as one may imagine, the media and public were speechless as a result of her sudden decision, a decision that marked a turning point in their relationship. Just like that, the romance brewing between the two ended, but despite that, they managed to remain friends, supporting each other, and continually maintaining high respect and admiration for one another, Harrison Ford and Callista Flockhart. Harrison Ford has a certain rugged handsomeness about him, and after playing a lot of iconic roles in his career, he could have any woman he wanted, but the moment Callista Flockhart crossed his path, it was the beginning of the end of his search. On the set of a movie in 2002, Harrison and Callista met for the first time ever, and it was love at first sight. Harrison, already an established actor with a long list of accolades, was captivated by Callista's charm and talent. Callista, who had risen to fame through her role in the hit TV series Ally McBeal, was drawn to Harrison's undeniable charisma and his ability to bring depth to every character he portrayed. As they worked together, a genuine connection blossomed between Harrison and Callista. They discovered shared passions and values, and their friendship evolved into something deeper. Harrison, having experienced the ups and downs of love and relationships, found comfort and fascination in Callista's down-to-earth nature and radiant spirit. Callista, too, loved Harrison's wisdom, kindness, and unwavering support. They were all they'd prayed for and were lucky to find each other. Their relationship took root amidst the glittering backdrop of Hollywood, where rumors and media attention often threatened to overshadow the genuine love they shared. However, Harrison and Callista remained steadfast in their commitment to each other, shielding their romance from the prying eyes of the public. In 2009, after seven years of dating, Harrison and Callista took their love to the next level and tied the knot in a private ceremony. The event was a reflection of their desire to keep their love story personal and intimate, away from the glitz and glamour of the industry. Over the years, Harrison and Callista cultivated a strong and enduring bond. They faced challenges together, supporting each other through professional commitments and personal triumphs. Despite their demanding careers, they made time for family, cherishing moments with their children and creating a loving home filled with laughter and joy. In the end, one could say that all of these women were go-getters who fell in love and didn't allow any naysayer to sway them. It was as though the entire entertainment industry came to a halt when the news about Carol Wayne's passing was publicized. The actress, who had made a name for herself through her popular role as matinee lady on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, was a vibrant TV sensation in the 1960s and beyond. Absolutely no one saw her death coming. Carol's fate left many with questions about her personal life and the circumstances that led to her demise. From her painful journey to fame to the unresolved mystery of her death, this is the side of Carol Wayne's life that very few people know about, the high price of Carol's early career. Some of the most famous stars who have made waves in the entertainment industry didn't come from wealthy backgrounds. They had to spend years toiling and pouring into their craft before getting their big break. Carol Wayne's story was not very different, but her journey to fame began when she was only three years old. Most people who knew about Carol Wayne during the peak years of her career didn't know the story of how she got there. For someone who was bubbly and bright on TV, Carol actually endured a pretty tough childhood. At the age of three, her mother pushed her to join a ballet school, and at the age of six, 
She and her sister Nina were actively learning how to skate. But this was no fun experience for them, especially because of how rigorous the training sessions were. They were required to wake up every day by 5 a.m. to skate for three hours, and their practice continued for at least five hours after school. Carol and her sister were choked with activities, and they barely had any free time to enjoy the joys of childhood. When Carol was not in school, she was taking dance classes, skating classes, and doing several other activities. These put a lot of pressure on her at such a young age. While the other kids were playing and making memories with their families, Carol was busy perfecting her skating skills. At that point, it seemed like that was the price she had to pay for success. When she was asked about her childhood in a later interview, she uttered these words, We missed a childhood of growing up. Thankfully, after several grueling years of training non-stop, Carol and her sister finally got what seemed to be a life-changing opportunity, but it came at a cost, a cost that they had to pay. She made an unconventional choice. It is often difficult to tell if a particular famous person finished school or not. When success comes knocking, no one really pays attention to the degrees and certificates anymore. This was the case for Carol Wayne, who later went on to become a well-known comedian. What a lot of her fans didn't know was that she had to sacrifice her education for her career. Because Carol was already pursuing a skating career in her teen years, other aspects of her life suffered greatly. She tried to juggle over eight hours of training with schoolwork, but it didn't work and everything changed when she was presented with an opportunity. Ice Capades had made a move to hire her and her sister for a tour, and that seemed like the beginning of her success as a skater. At the time, the Ice Capades were popularly known as traveling entertainment shows that particularly featured ice skating performances in a theatrical style. This was a huge opportunity for the Wayne sisters because it would allow them to not only showcase their skills in different towns and cities, but also enable them to garner fame. As a result of this, they dropped out of school in order to focus on their career, and it seemed like Carol was finally enjoying the fruits of her labor, but fate had other plans. While Carol and her sister were having the time of their lives on tour, something unexpected happened. Carol had a terrible skating accident that left her knee in a bad condition. The injury was so bad that she had to stop working and focus on recovery. By the time she had fully recovered, there was no place for her anymore. She practically lost her entire career and there was nothing she could do about it. She and her sister were left in the cold with no career and no potential opportunities in view. In a later interview, Carol described this period of her life as a challenging one for her and her sister. In her words, we were two pretty girls with no education. There was nothing else to do. More than a sex symbol. As you know, Carol's journey to fame was not an easy one. From the sacrifices she made earlier on in her life to the losses that she endured, Carol was met with setbacks on her journey, but she was determined to succeed in the entertainment industry. It seemed like her hard work finally paid off when she got a chance to appear alongside Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. During her time on the show, Carol made a lasting impression and quickly became a household name. On the surface, it seemed like Carol was focused on using her body to get attention, but what a lot of viewers didn't know was that she wanted to be seen as more than just a sex symbol. Carol worked tirelessly behind the scenes to hone her acting skills in order to get better roles, and she wanted to be appreciated for more than just her physical features. After appearing in over 100 sketches on the show, Carol was laid off from The Tonight Show, and that was the beginning of her career decline. It seemed like all her efforts to improve her career were not working out. She kept losing job after job, the alleged role her son played in her struggle with addiction. While Carol Wayne was going through difficult times, she desperately searched for an escape from her troubles. Her son, who was attending Beverly Hills High School at the time, allegedly thought it wise to introduce her to clove cigarettes. What started off with a single stick quickly morphed into an addiction as Carol found herself smoking profusely and indulging in other vices. Things got so bad the actress found herself filing for bankruptcy. The addiction took over her and she became a shadow of herself her career spiraled downward and it seemed like things were only getting worse for the actress. The alleged role her son played in her addiction is indeed surprising. The unsolved mystery of her demise. Of all the unsolved mysteries in Hollywood, Carol Wayne's death remains one of the most shocking. She had traveled for a vacation with her friend Edward Durston and she was set to have a good time. 
According to the reports, she was staying with him at the Las Hadas Hotel, and from the look of things, they seemed to be having fun, but things got ugly pretty fast. On the day they were supposed to leave, they allegedly got into a disagreement that caused a delay in their departure. According to the reports from the hotel workers, Carol left angrily, and Edward allegedly booked another hotel. The next day, he was headed to the airport to travel back home. But before he left, he dropped her luggage at the airport and instructed the officials that she was coming to pick them up. It was on the 14th of January by 2 p.m. that her body was found off the coast of a resort in Mexico. On the surface, it looked like she had drowned, but no one knew when or how. In a bid to dig deep and find out what happened to her, an autopsy was carried out, and there were no drugs in her system. According to the autopsy report, she had been lifeless for over two days. One thing was for sure, the circumstances surrounding her death were not very clear. Some thought she took her own life while others suspected that someone may have ended her life. Her family members and fans were left with so many questions that have remained unanswered since the 1980s. It's been decades since her death and this mystery remains unsolved. Carol Wayne's death was indeed tragic, but she is remembered today for the life she lived and the people she inspired along the way. The year was 1964. A new franchise was making its debut on CBS, and everyone behind it was scared to the bones. There were a thousand and one questions. What if no one liked it? It was an unconventional idea. But in the first episode, one small, tiny mistake slipped past the eyes of the team, a crew member visible in the film, ruining the illusion. This was the first of many little mistakes that eventually led to the most fatal mistake and ended the two-year run of what would have been a timeless series, The Munsters Next Door. Everyone is familiar with an everyday suburban family. We see them every day. We have some of them as friends. We could even be them. But what if your average suburban family wasn't so average and were actually a family of monsters? This was the idea that crossed the mind of Bob Clampett. He had been tinkering with the idea between 1943 to 1945, and he believed it was time to breathe life into it, so he decided to pitch it to Universal Studios. It was crazy. It was wild. Very unusual and definitely original, and there was every chance that the studio would reject it. But Bob, being an animator, believed in it so much that he sold it to them. Did they buy it? Absolutely. But there was another problem. The executives were divided on how the movie should be aired. While some believed it should be a cartoon, others thought a live action was the way to go. Eventually, the live action side of the board prevailed, and in 1964, the live action pilot of the show was aired. It was titled My Fair Munster. In all honesty, it was a stab in the dark. The movie may have gone from being a mere idea to being executed, but whether or not it'll be accepted by the public was a whole different ballgame altogether. Thankfully, Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis, the first cast, did a great job as a result of their O-screen chemistry, and the public fell in love with not just them, but the movie itself. Right from the pilot scene, it was already a great success, and thus, what would become a two-year franchise was born. But after two years of a good run, the show finally stopped and is now a shadow of its former self. Everything that starts must end, and so the show eventually had to draw its own curtains, right? Wrong. There are a few factors that forced the Munsters show to draw the curtains against their own will. Mistakes that sunk their fangs into the heart of the show and eventually ended its run. And the first one, you may not have seen coming even if you were a fan of the show. Sloppy production mistakes. The show may have painted this eerie and enchanting world that has captivated the hearts and interest of thousands, if not millions of people. However, behind all the spookiness and charm, there is a flaw, a terrible flaw that may have been hard to notice, but even more difficult to ignore when you do. Remember those mysterious bats that were fluttering through the air in the show, how they would cast their ominous shadows upon the unsuspecting residents of 1313 Mockingbird Lane. Well, here's the kicker. As they soared with an air of grandeur, even when the viewers knew that the movie was fiction, there was a fatal flaw in those scenes that would infuriate anyone who saw it. In their fervor to capture the essence of these winged creatures, the creators of the Munsters employed the use of wires, an ingenious trick that unfortunately didn't escape the prying eyes of those who sought out every minute detail. 
It turns out that during those scenes, the wires were still showing, which ruined the illusion of the bats flying on their own and it sent the critics to Critic Town, a mistake that slipped through the producers, but when critics start pointing things out, the show would not doubt be affected. But if you think the mistakes are over, think again. Terrible plot inconsistency. Well, one may argue that when you have a show where monsters and humans are living side by side, a lot of things are bound to go wrong, plot-wise, but the holes in this plot are apparently too terrible to ignore. For one, on the show, the Munsters regard their niece Marilyn, who looks like the ideal beauty of non-monster people, as ugly and deformed. Yet everyone else in the town of Mockingbird Heights basically looks like Marilyn. But that's not all. The Munsters also watch movies and regard then-popular stars such as Frank Sinatra and Rock Hudson as ideal men and Grandpa's beauty potions always conjure up a beauty who looks something like Marilyn. But here's the problem. Shouldn't their concept of beauty be horrible monsters, in accordance with the premise that Marilyn is an ugly duckling? On top of all these, there's also the inconsistency where the monsters seem not to be aware that they look radically different from non-monster people despite interacting with them on a daily basis. This begs the question, are the monsters frightening or not? Sometimes in the show they scare non-monsters, but at other times, interactions with regular people seem seamless, almost like the humans are not aware that they're interacting with monsters. The inconsistencies are way too obvious, and therefore the show has been slammed by a handful of critics. More bullets in the heart of the show, but will it finally give? This next mistake was an even harder hit. Crew member visible. Have you ever spotted a film mistake that was so bad, you laughed and asked yourself, how did the crew not see that? Well, in The Munsters, the crew apparently wanted a shot in the scenes, because in one of the scenes, a crew member could be seen through an open door beside the staircase. It's one of those details that you may not catch at first, but once you do, it's impossible to not see it. While some viewers caught it and had a good laugh, critics had a different perspective as they thought it was disgraceful sloppy, and extremely unprofessional that the mistake even happened in the first place. What makes this much worse is the fact that this mistake was in the very first scene of the very first episode. Is this an unforgivable mistake, or it's just one of those things? Either way, this in turn contributed to the fall of The Munster Show. Even when they had other good reviews, a great concept and a storyline, little by little, these little mistakes poisoned the perception of the show until this next thing caused it to fall off completely. Leave! Batman's in town! Despite all the bad comments and critics, the Munster show was still a resounding success, so much so that it was running for two years straight until another bully show came into town and bodies the Munsters. The name of the show? Batman. As the Batman movie hit theaters, it captured the attention of millions of people. Moviegoers flocked to cinemas eager to see their favorite superhero in action. This surge in popularity meant that people had less time and interest to watch other shows on TV, including The Munsters. As a result, the ratings for The Munsters began to plummet. With low rankings and declining viewership, the producers of The Munsters faced a challenging situation. They relied on advertising revenue and audience support to keep the show running, but the decline in viewers made it difficult to sustain the production. Despite their best efforts, they couldn't compete with the overwhelming popularity of the Batman movie. Sadly, the impact of the Batman movie on the Munsters was severe. The show struggled to attract advertisers who preferred to invest their resources in the highly successful Batman franchise. The declining ratings also made it harder for the show to secure a prime time slot, further decreasing its chances of survival. Eventually, the producers of the Munsters had to make the difficult decision to end the show. It was a disappointing outcome for the cast, crew, and loyal fans who had supported the series for two years. The Batman movie's immense success became a determining factor in the downfall of the Munsters, forcing them to pack up and quit, according to one of the producers, Patrick. He said, I think Batman was to blame. Unfortunately, this show came to a very sad end.